All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to welcome Ryan Margolin, who is actually back in Ireland, my home country, down in Wexford. How are you doing, Ryan? I'm not too bad, John. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to have someone from the outside on here <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for a change. It, not too often, actually, you know, in, in this, you know, in this yeah. environment, we come across somebody so close to home. Exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, Ryan's a serial entrepreneur and now is a coach consultant and, you know, helps uh, helps advise businesses and, and entrepreneurs. And one of the things that we were going to talk about today, it seems a really interesting one is, um, you know, a lot of people set up you know, entrepreneurs, you know, or, or go out on their own, set up a business, you know, and they sort of, they start, maybe they're a management consultant, they start putting all their stuff together. Um, and then somebody just copies it or takes it and, and they know because they've never really understood what I, what their intellectual property really is or how to protect it or even how to put it together. And, and so, um, Ryan, I know this is something that you've worked with a lot of folks on. Uh, do you often, you often come across people who, who really don't understand the how expansive the whole IP area actually is. One hundred percent, and you know that's even myself included. You know, over the last five to six years, uh, there's been a huge learning curve even for me in relation to that. And um, look, I, I think you know at the end of the day, it, when you have a business and you create something, uh, whether it be a brand, a physical product, or um, or as you said, documents that are part of a management system, that's intellectual property that you've created and you own and should therefore either be copyrighted or trademarked uh, efficiently and a strategy created to, to make sure it's being protected. Because the unfortunate part about it is that, you know, in different countries in the world, they won't, um, you know, if somebody is knocking off your product or copying it, you need to have protection rights in that, you know, country. So that that was a huge learning curve for us. For you know, for for us, we're in the physical product space. You know, we manufacture cosmetics. Mm -hmm. So um, going through that whole process of learning, you know, the difference between say a word mark uh, or you know a design mark or uh, you know copyright. Um, so or design, you know, protection. Uh, there's a whole there's a whole slew of different variables inside of the you know the IP realm that needs to be looked at depending on what you have, and when you look at that, it, it can function in one of two ways. Um, if you're growing a company with a potential exit strategy, uh, it can add value to the company, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, but if you're if you're building the business for something, you know, that's going to be a generational you know, transfer, um, it's going to do nothing but protect your rights in the different countries to be able to enforce them because technology is a beautiful thing nowadays. I mean, there's there's AI technology available to help you protect uh, your brands with e-commerce sales. You know, if there's different countries around the mm -hmm. world that are supplying counterfeits, they can be removed. Um, unfortunately, for physical products, when they hit the distribution channels, that's where they make the biggest impact, and it's very difficult that you have to get hands-on with the process. Right. Uh, but I find that you know, having a I, putting yourself in the position at the very beginning to uh, even have a discussion with a, a really good IP attorney, uh, it's worth its weight in gold because you can understand the mechanics of what you have to look out for and the strategies within the industry that you uh, are operating in that would be beneficial for you to keep an eye on moving forward. Yeah, because um, as you said, I mean, it's great to f go find some, find an expert in it because it, it is an overwhelming space. And and the thing is, if you go and do it yourself, even if it's, even if you have a small business, very contained business, it can even here in the States, I know you go into copyright or trademarking. It's a lot to, t it's a lot to take on to the point where I, I reckon most people just go, Oh, this is too much. I'll be fine. And and they don't do it. <laughs> they, yeah, they, you're right. They don't. And it, it can be quite overwhelming, which is why it's very important to uh, work with, you know, a firm or an individual who can simplify it for you because at the end of the day, copyright and trademarks and strategies is not something you really want to, um, focus your time on. It's something that you want to be in a position to know what it is, know what you're doing and why you're doing it and allowing somebody else to execute it because it, it can get, it's a long process and it can get quite in depth. You know, when you try to register something, you could have people that oppose you for similar marks or, you know, mm -hmm. somebody that's just trying to protect their class uh, of industry. 
So there's a whole different bunch of variables that, that you come across and you just need someone that can take it off your plate. But I do think it's one of the, you know, the three key things really that you need to focus on at the very beginning of, of, of your journey, because ultimately if you build something of any substance, uh, it's going to be the first thing that people are going to look to do and that's copy it. I've seen it happen in the physical product space. I've seen it happen, yeah. you know, in the system space, in the coaching and consulting space. Uh, and it's horrible to watch because, you know, it's somebody who puts their blood, sweat and tears into building something and that has, uh, you know, created something that contributes to people's lives and helps it. Uh, and then somebody comes along and just knocks it off as their own uh, and not as good, to be honest. Uh, it's just, it, it's quite frustrating to watch. Yeah. And not to mention, as you said, I mean, if you come to sell the business and you don't have everything protected properly, then, you know, the value of your business is, is uh, you know, somebody can drive the value right down because they can say, well, listen, I'm taking the risk here. You're exposed. Yeah. And and, that, and that's the thing, you know, it's um, like, I think for, for on, on the surface level, you know, if somebody's buying your business, I, I always look at it in two ways. They're, they're going to look for your, your IP and see what type of value mm -hmm. is involved in that. And if you don't have the correct one, it is a huge risk. You're right. Uh, secondly, they're going to look at the the operating procedures of the company because if the company is reliant on you know a single individual or a collective of a small collective like two or three individuals that are no longer going to be in the company when it's bought out, that's also another risk. So I think if the company's too reliant on those people, obviously that'll drive the the value down. That's why having strong operating procedures and SOPs in place are is vital for any company, even if you're not planning on selling it. Um, mm -hmm. It still adds value. So. Um, but IP, I think it, at, at, at the foundational level is, is probably one of the things that have one of the biggest impacts, because if you have something worth, um, copying, uh, it's going to be copied and I mean, <laughs> you're going to lose revenue, uh, you know, to, 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 to other companies yeah. like it or not. Yeah. Yeah. As Neil, uh, Neil Rackham, who wrote spin selling once said to me, uh, he, he said, uh, well, you know, when you've done something valuable, when somebody steals it. <laughs> not even copies it, but steals it. <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate, but it's true. You know, I, I look at our journey through through counterfeits specifically. Mm -hmm. And like our mission for our company was based upon, you know, health and safety and, you know, an experience right. we had growing up. Um, so when, you know, we're not talking about a T-shirt or, or, you know, a handbag here. We're talking about a cosmetic that somebody's putting on their skin. And when that's being copied in a subpar way, uh, it's, it's quite um, uh, demoralizing and, and it's quite frustrating because, uh, it goes against everything that you believe in and the reason why the, the company exists. So uh, for us, you know, we we very diligently um, chase these these counterfeiters and there is a huge cost involved in it. You know, you're you're mm -hmm. you're talking you could end up, you know, you can end up talking five percent of your 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 yearly revenue just to chase counterfeits. You know, it's it's a huge cost to enforce. Yeah, which I guess is a is a good point that if you're going into the physical product space and you are going to be going into a global market, I mean, as you said, I mean, if somebody counterfeits your skin products and somebody's skin gets messed up because of it, you know, you'd get the blame, even though it's nothing to do with nothing to do with you. So if you're going to go into the physical good space globally, then as you said, I mean, you have to take a step back at the beginning and and look at all the implications of it because it just seems to me that it's fraught if you don't do that. It is. And you know what, like it, it, it's almost impossible to know unless somebody says it to you, like the three key places we should have focused on at the very beginning was the USA, Europe, and China. Those are the three key countries that the trademark should have started. Relatively uh, not expensive. I think you can trademark all of them for probably uh, less than a few thousand uh, dollars. And then uh, as you start to focus on other markets and strategically focus on other markets, you start to you start to apply for the trademarks before you move into those markets. That way you don't have huge, uh, you know, huge bills coming at mm -hmm. you every single month for trademarks in countries that you don't truly know if you're going to end up in. So that that was our strategy after we kind of got a, a good hold on things. Um, but th those three countries uh, or three areas, sorry, Europe, US and China were the three key ones for us. And I, I would recommend anyone starting anything, look in those areas first. Yeah. Um, and I guess the other, the other part, too, is like is that you want to. Um, you know, you want to be able to roll things out in, in a good systematic fashion, right? So, and I guess part of the, probably a temptation today, because you mentioned technology earlier, so it's become a lot easier 
to have you know set up a global business if you like and even distribution but just because it's easier doesn't mean that it it needs less attention and work and i think there's probably people have come uh, come a cropper using even some of this technology solutions because they think it's making it easier yeah and and you you can you can rely on it to a certain extent you know it, it's like you know for example you move into a fulfillment center in another uh, country mm -hmm. you know to, to easy access or quick access to it. Um, you're relinquishing a lot of control there um, because then you're relying on the performance of the fulfillment center to make sure that your brand reputation stays intact and that everything is going out the way it should. So you always have to be prepared to let go of those certain things, but it, it, it's just really key that you always keep an eye on it because uh, you know things change very fast. And if you're not on the ball or your finger is not on the pulse, it'll get out of control to a point where number one, it's gonna cost you a lot more money to resolve, mm -hmm. And number two, it's just going to cost you a lot more headache, uh, more than than is needed. Yeah. So then, how do you, um, you know, when you enter a market like that, uh, uh, and you decide to go global, and there's, you know, there's rival products and there's knockoff products, there's all of that. How do you, how do you maintain your your brand, uh, and how do you make sure that people understand that coming from you, this is quality stuff, and forget about the ones that look like it or sound like it or whatever. I mean, that's got to be a big challenge. It was, and. You know, it took it took us. It was a mindset thing that really changed it for us. We we were looking at it, going, look, we've got counterfeits of our products in countries that we weren't mm -hmm. really targeting, but we know they're there. We know they're they're doing more damage to the brand before we've even really gotten a chance to get into the you know the penetrate those markets. So, uh, but we changed our mindset on it. We looked at it and said, okay, well, let's look at it this way. Our brand name is now in countries that we you know, didn't focus on or didn't, you know, didn't have any intention of going after for, for a little while. Uh, so how do we flip, you know, the script and actually um, make this uh, a positive in our, in our favor? So what we did is we started to reach out to some of these uh, sellers that were selling counterfeit goods on their site, and we started, you know, educating them and advising them. And uh, now it didn't always work out for us in the end. Sure. Some of them we ended up have, having to enforce. Um, but ultimately, you know, we were able to flip some of those sellers to realize that they weren't buying legitimate products uh, and they, they started buying from us. So there was a positive in it and it, 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 it's helped a certain percentage. But I think what's really great is that there's a thing called the WIPO system uh, when it comes to trademarks and it allows you to file one application and then for very small nominal fees, roll out your trademarks in other countries at the same time quickly mm -hmm. for much less of a cost. So when you have a strategy where you're saying, okay, well, look, for the year 2022 we want to focus on five more countries you submit one application and for like an extra maybe couple of grand on top of that you can roll out in another five countries on top of that so it's uh it's a very quick way to uh you know to knock down the pillars rather than doing single applications for each country that you need to get a trademark in and that's that that was our strategy we realized that our products are in these areas uh and we were like okay well right now we can't you know we, we don't mm -hmm. want to do five separate applications we just we file one application through the WIPO system, do the other five or four countries, and then we uh, and then we get quick trademarks that way. So that was a huge help for us. Yeah, and I guess when you when you advise other people, I guess even if somebody says, "Well, I'm only going to start small. I'm going to do this, you know, this couple of countries." I mean, it's obviously good to lay the foundation and say, "Yeah, maybe you are going to," but just in case, hey, what happens if things take off and you suddenly want to expand? You want to have the quickest way to do that rather than have to do everything, you know, one by one. Yeah, and and that's it. And and the truth of the matter is, is that that when you start doing things one by one, it it, it becomes a resource challenge. You know, it's the mm -hmm. you only have a certain amount of time in the day, and if you don't have the you know the helper, the resources there to do it, it's going to become challenging. So uh, having systems like that in place uh, is 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 a lifesaver because it just allows you to roll things out much quicker. And a lot of people don't know it exists. You know, like I remember the very first IP attorney we worked with in the United States. They were like, oh, no, you won't, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll focus on U.S. and Canada. And that's mm -hmm. all they did. Never advised this about Europe, never advised this about China. And then, you know, three years later, four years later, we were looking at it going, I, I actually just, I couldn't believe it, you know, what what, mm -hmm. what started to happen. So, um, you know, we, we, we've connected with another firm and uh, they've been you know, just absolutely amazing in terms of helping us with the strategy. So once a month we connect, we go through, uh, our, you know, our, our trademark strategy, make sure we're on track. Uh, we make sure that, um, you know, any, you know, counterfeit cases are being handled the way they need to be handled. And uh, it's just having that resource there and that team there has been a huge help in making continual progress. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it, it's it's fascinating. And then, I mean, just kind of estimate when you started off and obviously, you know, you, you learned a lot of this yourself, like how much how much time and energy was this sucking up for you in the early days? So I was working 12 to 15 hour days, six days a week um, for about six years. And that's that's the time that 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 it sucked away for me now. I mean, there's regrets I have over that period, but I also know had that time not been dedicated, it would have been a much slower proce process. Right. Um, you know, look, I think personally, you know, the personal development side, uh, focusing on that has helped me a lot. But um, when you get to a point of where you realize that, look, you can't continue to do this, that that's the point where you realize you've got to change your the way you're thinking to, you know, to make it a, a, a viable journey for yourself. Right. Because you miss out on everything. I mean, you miss out on the time with your kids, your friends, family, you know, partner. Um, there's a whole slew of different um, uh, things that you just end up missing out on. And, and and look, what life is for living as well. You don't want to be looking yeah. back, you know, when you're when you're 70 or 80 years of age and regretting the time that you missed. So um, I would say the sooner you can figure that part out, the better. <laughs> Yeah, no, I was going to say, yeah, you don't do back when you're when you're seventy, going, oh, let me tell you about the IP work I did. Yeah, <laughs> and the trademarking work. Yeah, yeah, no one is going to care. Yeah, um, but you you touched on a on a point that I just we just talk about briefly before the end. But you touched on a good point there, and that's a, a lot of entrepreneurs and people when they start their business. Like, I mean, you always think, okay, nobody's going to care about my business as much as I do, which is true on on some levels, but that can't be the excuse to do everything because you can't do everything. And eventually, and it's, it's that delegating, it's that letting go. It's that putting in, as you said, process, standard operating processes and stuff. That's the stuff that often really, you know, people go, well, I, I, I didn't get into business to do this. Yeah, exactly. And it's the tedious part of the whole process. Mm -hmm. In fact, for me, it's the part that um, I, I can struggle with at times, but I look at it this way. It's like, you know the process, you know the way it needs to be, and it might change, but if you do this once, that's it, you're done. You you, mm -hmm. you do it, train it, you hand it off, you're finished. Now that's a repeatable process, you know, you go in cycles. So uh, the key thing for me is I do time studies every three months on myself. So what I do is I, you know, for 15 minute increments, and I was taught this about five years ago, um, I, I, in 15 minute increments, I write down what I'm doing. And at the end of the week, I break it up into st uh, tactical, strategic, and, and self-care. And all of the tactical stuff that I'm working on when I'm finding myself inundated, I actually uh, consolidate and I offload to either somebody else on the team, or if it, there's times where our resources are stretched, we know we have to hire somebody else to do this stuff. So mm -hmm. it, 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 it allows me to try to remain as much as possible in a strategic position. And then obviously you need time for your self-care, you need time for your family, friends, kids, whatever it may be. But I think trying to keep that, um, intentionally creating that balance is, uh, is something you always have to keep an eye on as a business owner uh, or, or you know, an entrepreneur or what, whatever. I just think it's, it's vitally important. And you kind of don't realize, um, unless you're paying attention to it or unless it's written down in front of you, how much time you're spending on the day-to-day -day actions of the company, which if you're trying to grow a business, uh, you have to let go of that stuff at some point or else you're going to be the bottleneck. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the, the other thing, too, is today, I think it, it's great today that you can hire variable resources. You don't even have to hire them, you know, contract resource. You can use Upwork. You can get people from all over the world. There are so many different ways of scaling your business up or scaling it back, depending on, on where you are. But it all comes down to if you put in that work at the beginning, as you said, is just document your process or agree on a process or streamline a process, then that's something that you can outsource. Of course, absolutely. Um, and, you know, look, I mean, there's, as you said, you, you, you can look towards, you know, consulting for the creation of those processes. And I mean, mm -hmm. there's times where we do that as well. Um, you know, like right now we have, I, th I think we have close to maybe seven or eight advisors and, and consultants mm -hmm. that, that we have on our team that, that we can go to for different things. And uh, it is vitally important because you, there are times where you're navigating waters that you're unfamiliar with. And, um, I'm a firm believer that, you know, there's always a way to speed up that learning curve uh, and, it, and it just requires a bit of investment and a bit of time on, on your end. So, um, yeah, it's quite it's, it's very important, though. Yeah. And as I said, it's getting easier and easier to do. Well, listen, then, yeah. Ryan, this is this has been fantastic. You know, such in, interesting insights and some valuable insights. Um, all of Ryan's information is going to be below the video. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about the work you do and also your business. 
Yeah, so we're a cosmetic manufacturer. Our, our company is called Professional Hair Labs, and uh, we have uh, two locations in uh, in Florida, and we have one in in Wexford in Ireland. And uh, we sell B two B predominantly our own brand, but we also custom formulate for companies all over the world. And um, you know, the, we we adhere to EU uh, regulations, which is of the highest standard. So everything that goes out our door is fully compliant according to GMP standards. So um, you know, if you're looking for a good contract manufacturing partner, uh, we're definitely the ones to to speak with. Excellent. Well, I, I uh, encourage you to go check it out. And also, listen, thanks again. And check out, uh, as I said, all of Ryan's information, like Ryan's old, own website. You'll, it's fascinating stuff there as well and, and great insight. So, listen, thanks again. Thanks again, Ryan. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon.